so that I can see you and be touched by you and be changed by you. Father, I desire more than anything. Take me past the outer courts. When I was singing, we were singing that song, man, my heart was there. Take me past the outer courts. <laughs> past the holy place. Beyond the veil. Father God, take the veil away so that I can behold you as you are. So that I can see you as you are. Faith. Real faith. Takes you where? In the natural. Says you can't go. Real faith. Genuine biblical faith. Faith in God will take you far beyond human capacity and understanding to places you never thought and you never dreamed were even imaginable. Real faith caused Abraham to walk not knowing where he's going. But he believed. And that Unction inside him, that desire inside him that God himself put there, drove him. He said, I'm looking for a city, but it's not made with human hands, whose maker and builder and chief architect is God himself. I'm looking for a place not made with human hands. I'm walking. And something is leading me on. Cause Jeremiah to say, you know, these situations I find myself in, the troubles and all of the things that surround me. In the natural, anybody would want to give up. And I cry, and my heart is broken. I long, Father God, for something more than this. Something inside me burns within me. There's a holy unction and desire that presses me onward. It's the same spirit and anointing that called Joshua, who said, I'm not content to sit around with these folks. You're going up into the presence of God. I'm going up into the presence of God. I'm not going to let these barriers keep me. Nothing will keep me from pressing in to receive. I'm going up. That same unction in spirit was with Daniel and the three Hebrew children in a place that they didn't intend to be. But the situation of life led them there. And it would have been easy for them to give up. It would have been easy for them to turn in. It would have been easy for them to throw in the towel. But something inside of them caused them, even in the midst of that place, to press in like never before. And they believed that even in that place, that wicked place, that God's hand, and God's hand was upon them greatly. It's that same unction and power that when they faced the furnace, said, well, you know what? Our God is well able, but even if he doesn't, If I have to meet him, I'll meet him there. And he did. In the midst of the fire. In the middle of the furnace. Somebody was there. Something inside of them burned even hotter than the furnace that they were about to face. Something inside of them drove them beyond. Daniel, when he was thrown into the den, said, Oh, what a wonderful bunch of pussycats. And they don't feed them for about a week before they throw you in. But all of a sudden, they became his pets. Because something inside of him was greater than what he was facing. And his faith enabled him. You see, each and every one of them, they saw something far beyond what the natural eye can see. And they experienced something far greater than what was happening around about them. 
they were marching to the beat of a different drum. They heard something. It's like Stephen, when he's facing those who are about to kill him, he looks up and he fixes his eyes on the one. It's all for you, Lord. Let him stone me. Let him take my life. There are millions more coming after me, Lord God. They're not going to be able to, to crush me. They're not going to be able to go. Your stones won't hurt me. I see something far greater than you can ever know. There's someone beckoning me to go on. Something inside of me burned within me, causing me to go far beyond what my own human emotion and mind tells me you can't do. <laughs> Something inside of me says, come on, come on. I'm taking you through. We're going beyond. You might as well leave your emotions behind because they're going to scream against you. What are you doing? What are you doing, Enoch? You can't go there. You can't do that. The way's closed. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. I'm not content to hear stories about what you're like. I need to see you for myself. I need to know you for myself. I need to encounter you for myself. Do we have that same unction burning inside of us? Do we have that same desire burning within us? Or is this just the church thing that we do? It's more than praying a prayer at an altar. It's more than coming into a social club and becoming a member of the group, a part of the team. It's an encounter. Because you can be a member of the group and think you're on the team and the Lord himself will come up on side of you and you won't be able to, to see him if you don't have the ability to see. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. He says something profound in the midst when he's talking about Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Take no thought what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, all of that. But then right in the middle of that statement, in chapter 6, he says something profound. Matthew chapter 6. In verse 22. And you can put it up there if you want. Are you, are you able to do that? <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, that means if your eye be focused, if you are finely tuned, your whole body will be full of light. The next verse. But if your eye is evil, or dark, or if it's grown dim, or veiled, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that's in you shall be darkness, or is darkness, how great is that darkness indeed? There's a light that pierces the darkness. There's a light that shines far greater and much brighter than any darkness. Jesus said, you must have that light within you. 
a light that sees in the darkness and pierces the darkness. A light within you that can see far beyond the natural. He's not talking about these eyes. God revealed to Peter. Do you remember the conversation that they had, all of the disciples together? Jesus said, now who am I to you? Who is it that stands in front of you? I've been with you all these years, these three years now. Who is it that you see standing before you? And many said, oh, you know, well, the crowd says, they say, like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, after the crucifixion and all of the events that happened during that time, do you remember when they walked on the road, discouraged, perplexed, wondering what has happened? We went through this week. We had such hope, such dreams. This Jesus, Jesus comes by and stands right beside them, and they don't even recognize him. Can't even see him. Their eyes are dark. They are dim. They don't even know it's Jesus walking beside them. And Jesus said, what's wrong? Oh, well, we were, we were greatly disturbed because of what happened this, this past week and the events that took place even today. How God sent this great and mighty prophet. Now that tells me right there, they didn't even know who he was. He's more than a, just the prophet. No wonder your eyes are dim. You don't even believe yet. Who is he to you? You don't even know who it is that stands be beside you. Oh, you foolish and slow. Slow of heart, Jesus said. Then he begins to open up the scripture to them. All of the things in the word of God pertaining to himself. And then they get to the place where they're going and he, he, saw, he makes like he's going on further. And they beckon him, no, no, it's late, come in. Come in, please stay with us a while. So he comes in and they sit down together and he breaks bread. And in the breaking of bread, when he takes the unleavened bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them, they realize. And their eyes are opened and they see him for who he really is. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about in this passage of Scripture. And it relates to where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. What is the treasure of your heart? What do you hold most dear? What is your desire? Wherein does it lie? Your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. Are they wrapped up in you, your plans, your ideas? Or are they given over to the one who knows everything about you and his plan and purpose for your life is far greater than what you can even begin to imagine, what you can be, be, begin to even comprehend or even think up what he has in store for you if you believe. Where's your treasure? Where is your heart? Really? Do you know your own heart? Jesus said right after that verse, you can't serve two masters. <laughs> You're going to love one, hate the other. Despise one, cling to the other. You cannot serve, there it is. <laughs> you can't serve God and mammon. That word mammon is earthly things, corruptible things, ill gotten gains, counterfeit. Because everything in this world is fleeting. You can't love me and this. You can't love me, serve me, honor me, and cling to all of this. Jesus said, one has to go. There's only room for one master. There's only room for one Lord. I am king of kings. I am Lord of lords. You cannot serve both. 
And that's where our trouble begins today in the church because we want both. We want the best of both words. God, I want the blessing of, of God on my life. I want your provision. I want your healing. I want you to straighten me up. I want a good job. I want a good house. I want to be comfortable. And we treat God like he's some big, fat, spiritual Santa Claus. Just wanting to dole out presents on everybody. But yet, do we serve him? Do you really love him? Do you really desire him? You can't have both. You can't be in love with the world and with stuff and with, you know what? It didn't work for the Laodiceans, and it's not working today for the Laodiceans. And pretty soon, if they don't repent, and many are in that boat, Sad to say, that's this generation. It's this church. You know, by this church, I don't mean this particular church because the church is not one little small social group. Hello? Not one denominational brand. The church is made up of everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. Whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever you may call yourself or whatever sign may be on your building, that is not the church. The church is the body of Christ. All blood-washed believers who've come out of the world, who've washed their garments and made themselves clean through the word. We are much like the children of Israel. Too much, I think, like the children of Israel. In Numbers 13 and 14, we have the account of the spies who are sent. Do you remember after they came out of Egypt? Now imagine. Imagine this. You come out of Egypt. The power and anointing of God is portrayed before you. God reveals himself powerfully to them by his own hand his power comes against all of the false gods all of the idols and they are obliterated in every one of those plagues when every stronghold in that nation is broken and God shows himself to be just who he is God above all I'm, I'm coming against all of your vain imagination. And everything that sets himself up to be in my place. And I'm revealing to you just who I am. And before these people, my people, leave this place, you're going to know that there is a God who is in heaven. And he reigns supreme. He's sovereign. That means there's nobody else. He is so in authority, soul in power, soul in wisdom, soul in strength. There's nobody else. He doesn't have a committee, a Congress that he has to answer to. There isn't a parliament that has to give their yes and okay to everything he says. No, he is God all by himself. And what he says is, his word is eternal. Do you know this God? Do we really live like we know this God? If you did, you wouldn't cling too closely and too tightly to what's here and what's now. <laughs> because this can be gone in an instant. <laughs> and many lives are shaken and come to the end of themselves realizing, oh, my hopes and my dreams were in that house that just got blown to bits. My aspirations were in that job that just, just uh, left town. My, my hopes, my aspirations, everything I built my life upon was in that bank account that just closed. If you hold on to what's here and what's now, <laughs> Jesus said you better build your life on something that's eternal, not the sinking sands of this earth. 
not the, the sand of this roundabout. You've got to be built upon the rock. You've got to be built upon the rock. And that's the revelation that God was talking about. That's what Peter said when he said, Thou art the Christ. God revealed to him who it was who stands in front of him. One the prophet. Wasn't one of the dead ones who've come to life. Wasn't just a good man. He's the son of the everlasting God. He is eternal. He's God himself. Come down in the flesh. You are the Christ. The anointed one. The only one who is anointed. From on high. You are sovereign Lord. When he said thou art the Christ. That's the revelation. And he said Peter upon that rock. On this rock, the rock of that truth, that eternal truth, I'm going to build my church. Not on a, on a man, not on a foundation on, on men, on what that which is eternal, my word. The truth of my word, this revelation, that's what God is talking about. That's what Jesus is telling us. There has to be a light that shines greater within you, and it comes from the throne. It comes from the throne. This is the light. Do you walk in it? Do you know it? Do you serve under it? Those children of Israel, after all God did for them. Can you imagine? I can't even imagine. God himself destroys their enemy, brings them out powerfully by his own hand through the sacrifice of the lamb, the blood on the door. They come through to deliverance, and they get to the sea. Can you imagine? And there's, oh, my Lord, here we are. Come up against a brick wall, and look who's chasing here comes Pharaoh and his army, as if he didn't have enough already. Whatever possessed that man to think. After all that, are you really, Satan, do you really think? No, Satan was laughing all the way because he held those men and he knew, hey, well, I'm going to take them with me. He knows where his destruction lies. He knows where his demise is. And what's going to happen to him at the end? He just wants to take a whole lot of people there with him. He wasn't foolish enough to think that he could defeat. He knew. He already lost the battle in heaven, hello, and was kicked out. So now he's going to try and do the same thing to you and to me. Let me, let me lie to them. Let me speak lies to them. Let me take off their focus so that they don't believe the word. Let's water it down. Lord, let me water down the word so that they no longer believe the truth. And here are these children of Israel standing in front of the sea. Moses, what do we do? Stand still and see the salvation of God. Stand still. He hasn't brought us here to, to kill us. You think, hello, if he's asleep in the boat and there's a storm raging, you, y'all, you, you know what? Just, just curl up beside him. Lay your head right beside him and, and, and don't worry about another thing because if he's not worried... He's the master. The winds and the waves obey him, if you didn't know before. Oh, ye of little faith. After all they see, after all they experience, remember God came down on the mountain? This is after. The presence of God. Moses goes up, all of the rest. Then he comes back and those Dissenters are destroyed because of their lack of faith. Remember how they build this golden calf and call it by the name of Yahweh? They don't even know. Elohim, this is the one who brought us up out of the land. Where's the revelation? But you know what? We do the same thing in the church today. 
We have fashioned a God out of our own vain imagination who's like we are, who puts up with what we put up and loves what we love, and, and it isn't Jesus at all. And most of us serve a fantasy that we have built out of our own selfish desires, much like those who built that golden calf. They called it by God's name, said we're going to have a celebration to the one who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, and here he is. Do you know why? They didn't receive from God himself. When God came down on the mountain, they run away. So they had no revelation, real revelation of who he was. They didn't see. They couldn't see him. Didn't even know him. Even after God did all of that for them, they had come out of Egypt, out of their bondage, out of their slavery, healed by him. Deliverance saw his own hand. Deliver them from their own enemies. Destroy the enemy right in front of their face. Brought them through on dry ground. And here they are still not even knowing who it is. Who it is who stands before them. He's right next to them, standing before them, and they still don't know who he is. They get ready to go into the land. And Moses said, Now choose out twelve from among you, one from every tribe. And Joshua is there among them. Joshua and Caleb. And the other ten spies. And he sends them out. Now go. You've heard what God said about this land. Great fruit. A land flowing with milk and honey. Oh yeah, there are inhabitants there. But God is able. Go out and spy the land. See what God says, whether it be true or not. Everybody say, yeah, God was testing them. Yeah, he was testing them and trying them. But not because he didn't know what was going to happen. He knew exactly where in their heart lies. He needed to reveal to them where their heart was. And after they came back, there was going to be no question where in their loyalty lied. And if they really could see, and if they really did know him in the one in that they served, and they go and they spy out the land for 40 days, they bring the fruit back. These grapes are so big, man, two men have to carry them on. They're so huge. The fruit is plentiful. The land is prosperous. God had prepared it himself for them. But they didn't see the fruit. They didn't see the goodness. They didn't see the milk or the honey. All they saw was this giant. Could they see? No. No. They didn't have the ability to see. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is substance and it's evidence. But it's not substance of what you can see, what you can feel, what you even know within yourself. That's not the substance that he's talking about. And it's evidenced by what is unseen. Faith is substance of what's hoped for, evidence of things that are not yet seen. Faith doesn't depend upon situation or circumstance or the natural eye. It goes far beyond all of that. And it is completely contrary to the way we think, we feel, and the way that we see. You have to be able to see beyond the natural. Two men said, no, no, God is able. Look what he did for us. Look where he brought us. Come on, man. Look what everything that God did for us, and still you doubt? These men, <laughs> they're just men. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's given them over into our hands. And the people believe the bad report. They listen to the bad report. And God had enough. But we are much like those children of Israel. Especially in the church today. 
We don't follow with all of our heart. We don't cling to the word of God. We still love our human traditions and, our, and, and, the, and the things that are come, come from the world. We still talk like the world. We still say the things of God by, by despicable, pagan, worthless names. We call holy things by profane things. We take what's, what's, what's not holy and we bring it into our home and we pronounce, this is Christ. This is holy and it's not holy. Didn't come from God. Wasn't ordained by God. Wasn't instituted by God. Doesn't come from his word. It comes from the world. Vain imagination. It's the golden calf. It's a counterfeit. And yet we rather follow the counterfeit and give ourselves to the counterfeit because we won't be like everybody else. God help us if we should be really different. But faith says it doesn't matter what you think or anybody else thinks or what anybody else does, what anybody else has, or what everybody else gives credence to. Faith says, Lord, you alone. You alone. I serve you. I hear your voice. Yeah, I'm looking for a city whose maker and builder is God. <laughs> you have brought me out of this, and you are taking me beyond all of this. It's your voice that I'm clinging to. Remember, I'm Habakkuk. <laughs> I love that voice. I love that word. I love that name. The, the one who clings to me. <laughs> the one who adheres to me. <laughs> the one who isn't swayed by anybody else or carried away captive by anybody else. He's not concerned what anybody else thinks, what anybody else does. I'm clinging to him. <laughs> I desire him. I long for him. He alone, he recognized I can't serve two masters. There's only one. <laughs> and where my treasure is, there my heart will be. And God, you're my treasure. You're my treasure. What a sad commentary, though. These ones come back. And the bad report goes through the entire camp so that everybody believes. And only two men among them, only two, out of three million people, believe the word of God. And the rest of them die in the wilderness, never breaking through, never stepping their feet in the promised land, never seeing the fulfillment of the plan and purpose of God after having come out of their darkness after having been delivered from their bondage and their slavery. How sad! But it's a warning to us. Hebrew tells us, see to it that you don't despise the one who's speaking and you take heed to the voice that's calling you. Like those in the wilderness who did not believe the word and every one of them died there, never having received the promise because they didn't have the ability to see. Although they had experienced his power and experienced his grace and experienced his miracles, the evidence of his presence was all around them, but they still couldn't see him. In the midst of it all, they could not see him. And they died in unbelief. Faith said, doesn't matter what you see in front of you. There is a city there. There is a place there. Come and, come and walk, Abraham. I know you can't see it now. And I, don't know, I know you don't know where you're going, but cling to me. Hold fast to my hand. I'm going to show you. I'll take you there. Yes, you'll have to go through trials. Yes, you'll have to go through stuff. Yes, there'll be a lot of opposition that comes your way. But stand fast on my word. I'm faithful to my word. And I'm going to do everything that I promised to you that I'm going to do. You will be everything I called you to be. And even more. 
I'm going to baffle you, Abraham, by my provision for you. It ain't even going to be what you think. Oh, Sarah, you think you know? Go ahead and try to manipulate the hand of God. Try to bring about the plan and purpose of God by your own manipulation. God said, uh-uh, it's not going to be by that. I told you. It will be as I said. How many of us try to manipulate the hand of God? Bring about the plan and purpose of God. Because we aren't content to believe the word for ourselves. We've got to help God out. Anybody do Anybody besides me, I'll be honest, anybody besides me ever do that? Now, nobody dares raise their <laughs> hand. <laughs> but I know, hello, and some of you I do know real well, and I can, well, we won't go there. I can testify. <laughs> I got a witness. <laughs> hello. 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 <laughs> Are you all still here? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When we come to the end of ourself, <laughs> resort, you know, uh, uh, the end of our resource, the end of our stuff, and sometimes God will bring you to that very place. Okay, when, you're, when you are finished doing you, then, then I'll step in. <laughs> Hello? N and nobody's ever been there, right? All right, when you get up after you've done you, and, and tried everything that you have tried, and, and, and just run out of all of your resources, now you're going to look to me. And now stand still. And see the salvation of God. I don't know what you were crying for. I don't know what you were boohooing for. What you thought you were giving up. You, didn't, you couldn't even see. You couldn't even see straight through those tears and through those blind. Let those things come off your eyes. So that you can see my plan and purpose is greater than that. <laughs> what I have for you is much greater than this. Believe my word. <laughs> Let those things fall from your eyes. So that you can see what I see. Uh, this is why God said to the, to the prophet, come up here. What are you doing? You're not going to see it from down there. You got to come up higher. Come up to where I am. Come into my presence. Get as close as you can. That's the problem. We don't want to get close to God. So many of us think we're going to be missing out on something. Yeah, maybe hell. Was there anything good in your past? So good that you give God up for it? Everything that he brought you through, why do we go back? Why are we content to look back? Like the children of Israel, oh, that we go back to Egypt. Oh, you want to go back? Go ahead. Bye. Go, go back. Go back. What's in Egypt? After God just destroyed everything there, you want to go back to that? Back to slavery? Back to bondage. All right, let's take away your healing. Let's take away your deliverance. Now go back. Go back. You love it so much. Something back there that draws to you, but that's exactly the way that we treat God. We hold on to what is here, what is now. We can't see him who stands right in front of us. God has taken us to a high place. I love 1 Peter 1.13. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> ah, therefore, <laughs> since you know all of these things, gird up the loins of your mind. Sober, be sober. <laughs> and hope. Hope. Be confident, he says. Hope, that hope is not a I hope so hope. That's, that hope is I am confident of this very thing. That's faith. That's faith. 
Remember, substance of things that are hoped for. Oh, no, it's not a hope like we think. Oh, I hope so. Maybe so. Maybe it will be. No, no, that's not that kind of hope. That kind of hope is I know that 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 I know and it doesn't matter what everybody else says, what everybody else does. I know. I have full assurance. I am confident of this very thing. I know who holds my tomorrow. I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That's that hope. The blessed hope. Hallelujah. I am confident to the end, to the end, hallelujah, for the grace that is brought to me at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know if you press in, the more you press in, the more he gives out. He gives grace to the humble. The more you press in, the more you get. The more you cling, and adhere to him, the more you persevere, the more you press in, the more you believe, the more you trust, the more you anchor yourself to him, the more grace he pours out upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The more grace he bestows upon you, his favor. Hallelujah. His provision, his power, his anointing. So that you can do what he called you to do. Not in your strength. Because in your strength you'll fall flat on your face. But in the strength and the power and the anointing of the one who gave his life for you. That grace. That power. That favor. His grace. Is his empowerment. And the more you press in, the more you get. And it comes when Christ is revealed to you at the revelation of Christ. At the revelation of Christ. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. Do you really know him? <laughs> Do you really have the ability to look beyond the natural? And see what he sees. Not even what you can imagine. Because Paul tells us this, it goes far beyond your own human capacity to even have the ability to understand. Now unto him who's able to keep you and present you faultless before his glory. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all, that you can ask or even have the ability as a human being to comprehend above and beyond all of that, exceeding and abundantly above all and, and beyond. He will do. But it has to be according to the power that is at work within you, that comes to you at the revelation of Jesus. Let him reveal himself. He, he desires to show just who he is. He doesn't hold back from us. Huh? Remember Hebrews 11, 6? Anybody know that, that passage of Scripture? Hello? He who comes to God what must what? Believe. Believe that he is. That he is what? Sovereign, Lord, King of kings, rules and reigns supreme. Lord, you're above all. That God is. God is. Everything. Whatever I need him to be, God is. I need healing. God is. I need deliverance. God is. I need peace. God is. I need hope. God is. I need provision. God is. I'm lost. God is. 
I can't find my way. I'm the way. <laughs> but I can't know the truth. I don't know the truth. I don't know what's right and what's wrong. I'm the truth. Lord, my life is a mess. I'm the life. <laughs> I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I am that I am. Ha. Come to God. you got to believe that he is. He is. And that he rewards those who diligently, diligently, ha, diligently. That means with all my heart, withholding nothing. I don't let anything keep me. I don't let anything ensnare me. I don't let anything hold me back. I'm pressing in. I'm breaking through. I'm going on. I'm going to see him. I'm going to receive from him. I'm breaking through. And I know, because I know him, that he is a great rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And what he has prepared for me, my mind can't even begin to comprehend. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither have they entered into the mind and the imagination of man the things that God has prepared who those who love him. Amen. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise oh, praise his name. Hallelujah. Somebody should be praising God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. One thing the psalmist said, have I desired of the Lord. After that, I'll seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord ha, all the days of my life in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. In the presence of the Lord. Because wherever he is, that's the house of the Lord. Whether it's in my bedroom, that's the house of the Lord. If it's in the middle of a desert somewhere, that's the house of the Lord. Wherever I bend my knee and call out on his name, that's the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire at his temple. To inquire of him, to learn of him, to seek after him, to long for him, to desire for him, that I might know him, Paul said. Ah, everything else is like done. Everything else is worthless. The only one thing that really matters, that I might know him and be found in him. He's looking for people, seeking after hearts who worship him in spirit and in truth. And what then is worship? Is pouring yourself out before him, laying at his feet like Ruth on the threshing floor. I'm giving myself making myself of no reputation. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody else does. I need you. And I'm not ashamed to show you that I need you, that I honor you, that I desire you more than anything. I recognize that you are the only one who can meet me where I am. You're the only one who can heal this body. I'm sick, Lord, and you're the only one. Doctors can't do it. You're the only one who can touch me. I'm in need, Father, and you're the only one who is able to meet that need. So I lay myself before you. When I worship you, I pour myself out. Like that woman with the alabaster box, Mary, who came. Well, he was sitting at the table, and everybody looked at her. Said, oh, does he know what kind of woman this is? Look at her coming crying and moaning at his feet. 
took everything she had and broke it at Jesus' feet and poured herself out. And the Bible says the fragrance filled the entire place. And wherever men preach the gospel, she's remembered because of what she did at the foot of her Lord and her Savior. She gave herself, emptied herself, poured herself out because she recognized and she knew, I can see what all these other fools sitting around this table can't see. I know this one. He is not like anybody else. She saw beyond the natural. What nobody else could see, she saw. Ruth saw what nobody else saw. Little did she know, God was prompting her and leading her and guiding her. Naomi, I'm not leaving you. Let her go back. There ain't nothing here for me. I'm going wherever you go, wherever you dwell. Something inside of me is causing me to press on. I know there's, there, may, there may not be nothing there for me, but something inside of me is calling out to me, pressing inside of me, calling me to go forth and, and to come beyond. There's something that is there that I see. And, and it's not, and it's hard to, uh, to explain, and I cannot explain it in human terms because I can't see it in human terms. But something inside of me is calling me to press in and go on. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She lays herself at his feet and he awakes and looks upon her with compassion and he pours himself. Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody who comes to him, he will in no way despise. He's a reward of those who diligently, diligently seek him, who long for him, whose treasure is not in the things of this world, whose hope is not in what you can see or what you can't see. If you go down, I believe it's um, oops, the other passage of Scripture, uh, 1 Peter 1, and I think it's uh, right around 30-something. Uh, <coughs> it talks about purifying yourself. <coughs> 1 Peter, it's, it's a few verses after that uh, one there that we had, uh, 20, uh, what did we have, 13? Ah, verse, thank you, Jesus. Is that 22? <laughs> I think it's 22. Yes. Ah, hallelujah. You purify yourself. Do you know that? Through the revelation of God by the Spirit. In obeying the truth. You see, it's the Spirit of God who reveals Jesus to us. He's the Spirit of truth who leads us into all truth. So if you really desire Him and to know Him, and to press in, the Spirit says, come on, let's go. I'm going to show him to you. I'm going to reveal him to you. I'll make known to you just who he is. Whoever had this hope inside of him purifies their soul. You want to be holy? Without blemish? You want to be pure? Commune with the Spirit of God. 
I want to see Jesus. Oh, Lord God, that's my prayer, that I would see you, Lord. Take the blinders off my eyes so that I can see, truly see. That's why we go. That's why we go. Something inside us beckons us and calls to us. A lot of people look at us and say, you crazy. Why would you go halfway around the world, spend all this money, effort, resource, all the, re all the rest? Why would you do that? Pass Mike. There's a voice that calls and beckons. It's a fire shut up within my bones. No matter what I do, it's unrelenting. It calls to me. Calls to me. Yearning for me. Longing for me. Do I know what? I don't even know what's there. I've never been there. But I know who is there. <laughs> and who will be there to meet me. Because he's going with me all the whole way I'm there. And when I get there, he'll be there too. <laughs> and he'll say, okay, this is the way now. Walk ye in it. And I don't have to worry about what to take or what to do or what to say because he put. When I trust him and if I rely on him, you see, that's the rock. He's the rock. He's the revelation I know him to be. So I pray, God, let the scales fall from our eyes. Let the veils fall from our faces so that we can behold you as you are that we see you as you are, that we no longer hold back, stand back, but we press in by faith to obtain because you're our treasure. You're our inheritance. You are what our souls and our hearts and, and, and the longing inside of us. You're the fulfillment of every desire. All that I need, I have in you. I found you to be that, Lord God. So, Father, take me past, past the outer court, past the altar, past the instruments that are there, past the curtain. Take me through the veil. Take me through the veil. One thing that Jesus said of this generation, well, he said a few things. He said, you got to buy from me gold, because your gold and your silver is corrupt, and it doesn't work here. So you got to buy it from me. And you got to change your clothes because you're filthy. And I, 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 but I have white garments for you to put on and to wear. So change your clothes. And then he said, you need to anoint your eyes so that you might be able to see. Because before you can be able to, to walk, you have to be able to see. Before you can go, wherever it is he wants you to go, you have to be able to, to see. Without a vision, people perish. You have to be able to see. And that was Israel's fault. They couldn't see. They didn't have the ability to see after all God did for them. Do you have the ability to see? Do you see him? Do you know him? This one. Let's sing that song. Waymaker. <laughs> <coughs> You're here in our midst, Lord God. Do we have eyes to see you? You've called us to this very place today that we might hear this word because you desire something far greater than we even know. But you've brought us here. You've called us here. And you are here. And because you're here, 
We got to worship you. Oh, God bless you, Facebook. God bless you. We're getting ready to come to the altar, and we're getting ready to close out the service here, but I thank and praise God. And I pray that this word is taking hold of every one of your hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen.